Thank you very much, um, guys. Basically, it, it becomes apparent when speaking to affiliates day in, day out, that one of the biggest questions we always get asked, um, and one of the biggest concerns is, well, this is all great, I'm making sales, I'm making money, but it could be gone tomorrow. Google could change their algorithms, uh, this marketing angle could dry up, this product I'm concentrating on could go off the shelves. There's an apparent risk with what we do, and there's an apparent risk with any business that you operate, and, and as entrepreneurs and as affiliates, there are certain risks um, that I believe you should be aware of, um, and that we should put things in place to prevent those risks and, and mitigate them as much as possible. We, there's no way we're going to mitigate all the possible risks um, in running this business that we run, run. But hopefully I can pass some of those risks that you may be aware of, you may not be aware of, um, and help address some of the uh, concerns that affiliates tend to have when running their, uh, their own business. Um, so just to introduce the session, First thing I want to, to clarify is that you are running a business. You might be running it from your bedroom, you might be running it for an hour a day in your spare time, but it is a business and you have to treat it as such. Um, if you run a good business, you invest, um, you will reap the rewards, you learn money, you'll make sales, you might grow that business, you might hire staff, um, and you might take it to that next level. You might not want to. If you run a bad business, then you might not be around tomorrow. So if you take one thing away from this uh, topic, it's you're running a business, treat it like you're running a business, and I think that you'll progress faster than doing it as a hobby. Um, so during the, the, the session, I'm going to demonstrate how to identify certain failures within a typical business, uh, a typical affiliate marketing business, look at how we can correct and protect that income for the long term, and also develop the building blocks for going on uh, and, and growing this to hopefully whatever you want it to become. Um, I know some people in this room who are traveling around the world and, and, and it's an internet business so can do that. So work wherever they are, whenever they want. Other people might want to grow it into a business where they've got staff, um, they might have their own products. There's so many places you can take this and it's completely down to you as the individual as to where you want this to go. Um, so hopefully we can mitigate some of those risks to help you do that. Um, so the key areas of risk I see um, are general affiliate marketing risks, which uh, we'll discuss, global affiliate marketing, uh, internet marketing risks. Um, so regardless of the business that you're operating on, online, there will be these risks that you might want to avoid. Um, and then these ongoing legal risks um, that we'll cover as well. Um, I'm going to assume the fact that you're sat here um, and do, I can skip the geeky parts, the backing up your website, um, making sure your hosting is sufficient, getting dedicated IP addresses um, to avoid naughty neighbors, damage, damaging your risk from an SEO point of view. Um, I'm going to uh, appreciate, I'm going to um, hope that you understand the risks of you using WordPress and open source software um, and that you use secure passwords. But, if any of those are a concern and you want to talk more about them, then grab me um, or after the event, let me know because there are other risks that uh, I just don't have time to cover in this, this uh, presentation. Um, so the, probably the biggest risk I think that you need to ask the question, um, which is what would happen if Mornish wasn't here tomorrow? Um, a large number of affiliates in this room probably earn a considerable, if not all of their income from Mornish. So, although it's probably you're asking, well, why the hell is he telling us that? He's the managing director of Mornish. The last thing he wants us to do is to uh, promote other products, but that's not true. Um, at the end of the day, if you're successful with internet marketing in any area, whether it's with Mornish or without, um, then you will grow as an individual and as a business. Um, and we're here for the long term, and we want to work with long term players. So, if you're successful with or without Mornish, then Join us for the ride, and, and it's, um, it's something that we want to work with you with. Um, so, you know, one risk which you have as an affiliate is having your all in, eggs in one basket with one affiliate network. And I would recommend to everybody in this room that if they've not looked at other affiliate networks and if they're not earning money from other networks, then, then do it. You know, we're not the only network out there. We believe we're the best, um, and we try and be so, but we're not. And here's some examples, you know, 
free trials were big, big money, and in the last sort of few years, people have made a lot of money from free trials, but they're going because, well, they're not free trials. Um, the customers have been signed up to a scam, ultimately. Um, and good riddance. So we've got other networks that have gone into administration, um, and, you know, um, you've got acquisitions and mergers, and so there's these risks um, which you can avoid and, um, you know, you need to look at. The other uh, issue is becoming niche or product dependent. And, you know, we pride ourselves on working with multiple niches and we will continue to do so. Um, but if you've got all your eggs in the weight loss basket and um, Google decide, right, we don't like weight loss, um, we're going to do something about that, then again, it's, it's an inherent risk that you have as an affiliate. Um, and one recommendation is that you uh, look at promoting different niches, different products. Um, I think uh, a lot of people in this room do market multiple weight loss products, for example, if you've got a weight loss site. And if there was an issue with a certain weight loss product, you'd have the ability to, to change that and, and just change the ranking. So we're helping take a lot of the risk out of that. Um, but it's something for you to be aware of. If you're concentrating on one industry, then you may want to look at uh, working on, in some other industries as well. Um, and there's a lot of new products coming in, a lot of new markets. Um, and generally the first people in are going to make the most sales. So. Um, here today, gone tomorrow, uh, there could be an issue with a brand no longer can be sold. Fast Size, which is one of our competitors uh, for one of our clients' products in the States, uh, had an issue with their product, so they're gone. Uh, there's ongoing legal um, restrictions and tightenings coming into the marketplace, so again, um, it's, it's a case of protecting yourselves. Uh, as affiliates, you can't control what the merchant does in a lot of the cases. So the merchant might decide, right, okay, we're going to go and put our product into Boots. Suddenly a product that you're selling for £30, Boots, for whatever reason, decide, oh, okay, we're going to do a two-for-one, we're going to reduce the price for £15. Suddenly no one is buying from affiliate sites, they're buying offline. So the, you know, these are the, the risks that you should be asking your affiliate managers, you should be asking your merchants to make sure that you're aware of what their long-term plans are and you fully understand the products, but also the businesses that they're operating. Um, you know, they have the ability to change commission structures, should it work for them. So additional risks that you just need to be aware of. Everyone hates chargebacks, um, and you're never going to have no chargebacks. You're going to have buyer remorse, uh, friendly fraud, whatever it might be. Um, but here are some suggestions on how we could reduce the number of chargebacks that you receive in. You've heard it already today from the guys that have already spoke, but it's all about the message that you portray to the customer. Um, buyer's remorse and, and, and people charging back because they believe they haven't got what they've been sold is primarily down to a consistent message between you, the affiliates, and the merchant. Um, and if you're promising one thing and the merchant is delivering another thing, then ultimately the customer's going to be unhappy and, and it could result in higher chargebacks. So, not only for conversions, but also managing your chargeback rates, it's critical that you are passing a similar message to what the merchant is saying. So use the claims that they've provided, use a similar tone um, and a similar message to what they're using on, on their website. Um, it's important that you um, don't oversell the brand, as I mentioned, using the same claims, um, just keeping that consistency throughout. Make sure you speak to the affiliate managers who are, def are on hand to review your websites and make sure that that consistent message is flowing throughout. Pay to search traffic, just to cover that. Some people, when they start internet marketing, they say, wow, I can get 10,000 visitors for $10. Um, people that are being paid to visit websites is ultimately where the traffic is coming from. And well, the reason they're doing that is because they want to earn money and they don't have money to spend on a weight loss product. So if you're getting paid to surf traffic to deliver uh, to your website, chances are they'll buy it because they like the look of it then, but then they'll realize, well, actually, I can't really afford it. Um, so again, look at your traffic sources, find out what keywords you're, uh, you're searching for. If you're ranking for, I want the cheapest weight loss product on the market, um, then, and you're selling them Proactor, which is the most expensive, chances are they might regret it after they've placed the order. Um, so just bear that in mind. Look at the traffic. Look at the products out there. Um, chances are, if you sell a £20 product, 
um, you can have less chargebacks than if you sell a £70 product uh, because of buyer's remorse. Um, so you're full-time now. Uh, you want to be a full-time affiliate. You've got these ambitions. You've heard the top affiliates telling you how much they earn. Um, one of the biggest things is jumping too soon. Um, so I would say don't run before you can walk. Make sure that you come away from this event knowing where you're at now and the, the earnings that you're making at the moment <coughs> and where you want to be and understand your requirements as an individual for your living expenses and, and what it is you need um, out of affiliate marketing to make it your full-time career if that's something you want to do. Um, so I think it's very important that before you give up your day job, especially one that pays you quite well, um, you need to get your affiliate earnings to a level. You need to understand the model um, and just make sure that it's the right decision for you and, and you don't jump too soon. Um, moving on to more internet marketing related risks. Um, this will come down to, to a, lot of, uh, a lot to do with the websites that you operate. And again, I use the phrase a few times, but putting all your eggs in one basket applies to so much of this and there's so many risks that we, we, we've found. Uh, a number of affiliates who have only got one website, they might be the biggest, best website in the world, but anything could happen uh, to that website and you've lost your entire income. So if there's any one thing uh, you can take away from this as an affiliate who only operates one website at the moment is duplicate that uh, model that's working for you. Um, look at your business operations, look at where they're operating, you know, look at sites in your mind and, and just picture your operation. And if it looks quite lonely because you've only got a few little things going on, then you probably need to look at growing that picture uh, and diversifying. Um, do you have a, one money-making website? Do you focus your efforts on one type of site? Maybe it's brand-specific. Um, if you've only got brand-specific websites, then that's a different risk, but it's still a risk because you need generic traffic. So all of these things um, can put factors in place that, that will result in, in issues down the line. Um, are your websites, and we've seen from the recent SEO changes uh, with Panda and the like, that Google doesn't want flat, boring, uh, thin sites that offer no value to the consumer. Google wants authoritative sites that have a lot of content that when the surfer lands on that site, they get what they're looking for. So if you're spinning articles uh, left, right, and center, throwing up loads of garbage, um, then chances are Google's not going to like that. They want you to build a site where people visit the website, they like what they see, they stay on there for as long as possible, and they have a desired action. So let's ensure that you have doorway sites. You know, use your brand sites. Um, if you're targeting brand terms, then it doesn't need to be the biggest site in the world. But don't expect them to be ranking for generic terms. So build your brand sites to rank for brand terms. Build your generic sites to rank for generic terms, but expect that the generic sites are going to have to have a hell of a lot of content on them, be regularly updated, and make sure that it's quality content, as I think a number of people have already said. You can't just throw up crap anymore, which you could do even a year ago. Nowadays, you need to build quality, and it goes back to the fact that you're running a business. And if you put a website up, and you look at it, and you say, Am I proud of that website? Am I proud of what I'm doing? And you, you question yourself and say, well, no, that's, that's not the best that I could be doing. Then it goes back to you're not running a very good business. You need to put websites online that you can sit back and say, I'm really proud of that. It's adding value. It's delivering the results it needs to deliver. Um, and I think ultimately that's what Google wants. Um, and if you're doing, focusing on organic traffic, then websites that add value and you can be proud of, I think, is, um, is the goal really there. Back to offering little value. If Google look at your site and they're doing it all the time, manual reviewers now getting uh, more and more involved. If a manual reviewer hits your website and sees that it's an affiliate website, you've got banners, you've got affiliate links all over the place, they're just going to trash it. They're just going to throw it out, give it a penalty. Because they, Google, believe that affiliate sites aren't adding value. Your main purpose of that site is to make money. And if your uh, motivation is to make money, then probably you're not adding value to the consumer. So you need to make sure that when, if a, uh, a manual review happens on your website, that it, it, it comes across as it's adding value. And yes, you can have affiliate links in there, but make sure that you have, you're offering more value than you're taking away. So if you look at your website and you say, well, 
there's probably more affiliate-driven content than none, uh, than not, then, then they'll look at it in the same way. Whereas if you've got a lot more good content and you've got a few affiliate links in there, they'll probably just say, yeah, okay, happy days. So just something to be aware of. Traffic sources. So many people in this room probably are dependent upon Google, and uh, everyone is because it's, it's the biggest traffic source out there. Um, but what would happen if your sites were canned from Google? We've already heard about building lists as a good way of having residual income. Um, so that's very, very important. And ultimately, you need to make sure that you're not reliant on one traffic source. If you are, if all of your traffic is coming from Google, then we need to look at how we can diversify your business model and get traffic from other sources. So building lists is, is a fantastic uh, opportunity to get that uh, value and remarket to those people, and it, you're not 100% reliant upon Google itself. Social media, it's a buzzword, and I've always been the same, well, social media, what the hell is that? It's irrelevant, it's not important. Um, it's becoming more important, and it's becoming more relevant. And with the Facebook likes, the Google Plus ones, all of these things, Twitter, you know, they are avenues in which you can build a brand. And it might not be the best place to sell a diet product, but if you're building a brand in your entity or business, whatever it might be, um, these social media platforms are becoming very important in terms of sharing things with friends, distributing your message, um, getting honest and transparent feedback. And another thing that um, everybody wants these days is open, uh, transparent vision of, of what it is you do. So if you're selling a diet product, people want to be openly able to discuss that diet product. Is it going to work for me? Is it a good product? Um, and that's the way the internet's going. Everybody is on Facebook. Everybody's discussing things um, and sharing things. And so if your product doesn't stack up or your business doesn't stack up, then it's going to become very transparent very quickly. Video marketing is another example of an area which is growing. It's becoming more and more important. And you, know, you should be harnessing all of these technologies um, and evolving yourselves moving forward to make sure that you're getting traffic from all of these other sources. Uh, video marketing is an example of a, a good revenue stream for certain types of products and uh, services that you could offer. Um, going back to adding value to the customer, which is what it's all about, is you know, have a daily diet tip. Have a content that you continually publish on a daily basis or a weekly basis where you build up a subscriber list, you build up uh, that value. And it, again, email lists are working exactly the same way. You're building up that trust and that transparency. And you can do it through video marketing. It's another outlet. It's another way to build up your profile, um, building the trust, and, and, and telling people things along the way. It's, uh, it's another way to work with, in, in align with your email lists, building email lists we've talked about a lot. Um, offline marketing. Everyone in this room um, is here because they're keen to promote online. And we all know that online is, is where everything is going. Uh, we were just discussing moments ago about all the retail shops closing down because everyone's shopping online, uh, which is true. But it doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities offline that you could use. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities in the offline world um, that will allow you to drive visitors back online. Um, we've seen the PR that the likes of Advanced Health can generate, and we've seen the effect that has in the online sales. So we shouldn't distinguish between online and offline. They're not two separate things anymore. They were before, but now they're interlinked. And every advert you see, they're sending them to their Facebook profile. They're sending them to their website. So everybody knows that you see something offline, you know, and then you, you can look online and find it. Everyone, everything's accessible online, and everything can be brought online these days. Um, so explore opportunities to get offline exposure, driving people back online. And, and there's, there's a whole. There's massives of opportunity in, in PR and, uh, and, and other ways of, of driving offline business back online. Yeah, everyone says it, but you know, really do sit down and think, well, OK, I'm doing it this way. Maybe there's opportunities that, well, there's definitely opportunities that we haven't discussed today, but there's, there's so many things happening and so many things evolving. Um, and really just exploring those you know, um, and, and looking at what else is out there. 
people like Facebook and Twitter weren't around a few years ago. Um, so there's always emerging technologies that is going to allow you um, to move forward. Um, so just think outside of the box, look at other opportunities, and take it from there. Yeah. Another risk is, is obviously uh, languages um, and concentrating all your eggs in one marketplace um, or one language. Uh, an opportunity, more than a risk, really, to, to, to gain more sales from the same amount of work that you're doing is looking at moving into foreign language markets. Um, a lot of clients in, are already doing it. We've got a lot of French, German, Spanish translated websites that you can promote. Um, obviously, looking outside of more niche, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of opportunities out there. Um, so just moving outside of the UK market, and you can spend an hour creating the perfect article. You can put it up, but the cost of translation these days is so cheap and so cost effective that if you get that article translated into five other languages, you've suddenly got five other unique articles on your website. They're not going to be flagged up as duplicate content. Um, you've got five other opportunities in new markets to make that sale. So um, building out, potentially build an outsource team, people that you can call upon uh, to pay per article and replicate the, the same content um, and get two, three, four, five times the benefit from that same, same content. Um, look at building the thicker sites. So we mentioned Google doesn't want to see basic small sites. Um, so that will allow you to have a site. If you have 10 articles in English and you translate that 10 times, you've got a 100-page site. Um, the site is bigger, it's more powerful, um, and it doesn't cost a lot of money. That's, that's the, the point I'm trying to make, really, is that translation is so cost-effective these days, and it opens up millions and millions of potential viewers that, that you're cutting off otherwise. Uh, you know, English isn't the first, uh, the most popular spoke language in the world. Um, there's so many more people out there. Same amount of work uh, involved, unlimited times the exposure. In terms of your, make, your key make money site, that's the one really you need to be focused on initially. If you've got one website that is bringing in the money, then just replicate that site and, and work your way from there. So additional, more internet marketing risks um, is if your revenue stopped tomorrow, and we mentioned it with the list building again, and the Google changes, if your revenue model stopped tomorrow, are you out of business? And you need to ask yourself that question. Um, if a key site or a few of your key sites disappeared, could you continue doing what you're doing, or would you have to go and get a job down the road? So make sure that you're spreading your risks and you're not over-reliant upon one marketing uh, avenue. So building the email marketing campaigns to continue that ongoing revenue stream, um, promote merchants which support monthly subscriptions, perhaps. Um, we don't have any merchants in our network, but there's a lot out there that do have ongoing revenue share, um, and it does stack up. If you've got 100 people recurring every month, then that could be uh, a considerable amount of income without any extra work. Um, so it does grow quite quickly, and it's the snowball effect. Um, build a downline of children, you know, refer people uh, to different products and services. A lot of people will refer people through whatever reason, whether they like the products or services or whatever it might be, um, and, and get the ongoing revenue share. But we also need to think that these are new, potentially new uh, internet marketers out there that we've just referred to, let's say, more niche. There, there are going to be a lot of questions. There's going to be a lot of other services that they need to be recommended and referred to. They're going to need hosting. They're going to need to buy a domain name. They're going to need an article spinner software. There's all these other supplementary uh, recommendations, which goes back to building the trust. If you've got the trust in that individual, you can sell them something, but you can continue making money from them for the lifetime of their internet marketing experience. People in this room have brought hundreds of thousands of e-books and guides and make money overnight things. Um, and so if you can be the person recommending those, then, then you can make money along the way. Push merchants that have large reorder rates. We've covered it with Fan um, and the new brand that's coming. Uh, find merchants that are proactively investing in reorder rates and, and making sure that the customers are reordering. Um, analyze that. Talk to the affiliate managers. Talk to the merchants. Um, and as Sanders has pointed out in the previous presentation, it can stack up 
to be quite a considerable ongoing uh, revenue stream. I've been saying it all throughout this presentation, but you're developing an asset here, um, and you need to see it as an asset. Um, as with any business, we can all find cash cows where we make lots of money overnight and it's gone tomorrow, but if you want a long-term successful business, you need to be investing in your assets, which are probably your websites. Um, don't just throw up sales pages. Um, make sure that you invest your time and effort in building your long-term business strategy. Email captures, newsletters. Um, take time. They take work. You know, if you say go away from this conference and say, right, I want to set up an email campaign, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, you just go to Aweber, you set up your account, you load up some autoresponders. Um, but it, it's not quite that easy. You do have to put time and effort in making sure your autoresponders convert, making sure that your deliverability is at the rate you want it to be, make sure that your sales funnel works and your offering's right. Um, so it's developing that asset and that business that is a long-term asset and a long-term business. Um, and, and these are all the tools that can help you do that. Get them social media exposure. Build your brand not only with your own assets, but external assets and, and build your exposure. Sticky content uh, is always um, good, giving people a reason to come back to your website. So they've got the tips, as you say, in the email and newsletters. Get them back to your website. Have a forum. Have the ability for people to interact. The more sticky content that you can get people back to your website um, and continue to re remarket to them, um, the safer it will be. Um, you don't want the customer turning up, liking what they say, going off. They're not going to remember your site. They're not necessarily going to remember how they found it. Um, so if you give them a reason to come back, uh, then it's a lot more likely that, that they will do. Uh, User-generated content is, has its advantages and its disadvantages. Um, someone could go on there and say, that oh, your product's crap. Um, so you have to be quiet. Uh, and if it is, then fair enough. And if that's a genuine comment, then... Uh, there you go, but it's good for search engine optimization to have lots of regular content being added to existing pages. Um, I would say user-generated content is a great thing. It's opening up transparency, and as long as you get rid of all the spammers and crap that come along with it, um, and the ongoing maintenance of it, then um, it, it's definitely to be considered. Um, so moving away from internet marketing-related risks and onto more legal things, um, I'm going to run through some obvious risks. Um, obviously, don't steal content, don't steal images. Um, the amount of people that we have to deal with because of that is, is just stupid. Um, don't spam. You know, we're building lists, but let's do it in a proper way. Uh, let's double opt in. Uh, let's make sure that we're building our assets and our businesses um, and you acquire your data correctly. Um, Build fair and factual reviews. That's the biggest thing I can say to you guys, is go away from this um, and make sure that the reviews that you're putting online are fair and factual. You've got your uh, content from the merchant sites. You know what you can and cannot say. Um, and if everything is correct, then you won't have any problems. Um, Merchant-related risks. You know, Make sure you don't get into trouble with the, the merchants that you're promoting. You need to make sure you understand the products that you're promoting, that you speak to your affiliate managers, and, and that you're doing everything you possibly can to, to ensure that you're, doing, you're saying the right things. So every product in our network um, has now a advertising tab which tells you exactly what you can say about a merchant's products. Um, so if you're promoting Proactor, for example, there's a list of things that it tells you you can say this, you can say that, you can say the other. If you go ahead and say, take Proactor, you'll lose five pounds in a second, and somebody comes up and, and uh, asks you what the hell you're doing, you can't come complaining to us because this is the list of claims that you can say. Um, and it's important that you understand what you can and cannot do. Um, don't just go out there. Uh, and I know these brands on the table that are completely new to you. You've got Fullfast um, and you've got Provolin. I already know people are there buying domain names, and the people that are going to make the money are the people that act, as we've said. Um, people have been registering domain names on their lunch, and what I would say is that brand domains are great, they add value, um, but the merchant might turn around tomorrow and say, we don't want brand names, um, we're going to enforce our, our trademark and um, uh, basically clear up brand names. So just bear in mind, if you're a very brand-specific affiliate, then um, I would seriously consider 
asking, because once you've asked permission and the merchant said that's fine, there's an extra layer of protection there for you. Um, but just, just ask consent if you're really going to go down the brand name strategy. Um, monitor the merchant's websites. We mentioned it earlier about having that clear and concise message between your site and their site. Merchant sites do change. They run offers. You know, you've got dynamic sites in the network, uh, stores, big stores, Evolution Slim in. Um, they might have a featured product on their site today, which when you're reviewing the site and you're writing about it, it's great. But tomorrow they might have a better offer on the front of their site. So there's no point in saying how great their Ackerberry products are and sending it straight to Evolution Slimming thinking that the Ackerberry products are the ones that are going to be on the homepage at all times. It might not be the case. So um, do your homework, continually monitor what the merchant sites are doing and, and represent that in your marketing. And it's a way to get fresh content back on your site. So if they're running an offer, if they're running a coupon, then get it back out there and, and, and update existing articles as well as adding new ones and just keep it fresh. Um, work with affiliate managers. Uh, it's the biggest thing I can suggest to everyone here is make sure you're communicating with affiliate managers. We've got uh, eight affiliate managers now. Um, there's got to be one of them that you enjoy getting along with. So talk to them, uh, get to know them, uh, and ask for their help. That's what they're there to do. They're there to help um, and help you make sales. And I think that's one of the, the, the biggest things I can say is really if you're making sales, the merchants are making sales, everyone's happy. So we're, we're here to help. Um, and speak to the affiliate managers, whether it's about legal things or otherwise. Um, just covering a few specific things which are coming up. Uh, obviously, e-privacy law, people have uh, spoke to me uh, about it. Um, this is law. This is, this is in place. Um, we have a grace period um, of 12 months, which people are working towards. But this is law now. If you drop a cookie on somebody's computer and you haven't seek consent, then potentially you're breaking the law. Um, so you need to understand what your website is doing. If you're dropping cookies, why are you dropping me cookies? Is it necessary? Most static websites don't have a need to do that. Um, WordPress, as a blog, does drop cookies. So you need to address that. And if you're using a WordPress blog, then have a look at what cookies are being dropped and what you need to do about it. So just understand what you're doing. Do some research into it. It's not going to go away, that's for sure. Um, they will be enforcing it in one way or another. Um, I've heard a lot of things about there'll be a browser-based solution. No, there won't be. It's your responsibility at the end of the day to comply with law. So um, you do need to know about it. Um, we are going to be. We are working on ourselves, and in terms of our tracking, uh, we are working on uh, making sure that it doesn't get affected by that. And we'll certainly have a solution implemented well before the end of the grace period. Uh, trusted sites, I would say, are going to become a lot more important for you guys. Uh, referral tracking uh, is a good way of uh, ensuring that we can still identify you as the referrer when the sale is generated. So if you don't use or aren't aware of what trusted sites are, then it's important that you ask and you know what that is and you add as many of your websites as possible to uh, the list of trusted sites. Uh, speak to me about these things um, if you're unsure. Um, the only other thing really is what uh, is earning disclaimers um, and at the moment it's likely uh, that earning disclaimers are going to be required on affiliate sites um, but that is something that we're currently working through um, and you know you've already seen market health if you're aware of who market health are is one of our American uh, I guess you can call them competitors but they're not really um, has already published their requirements on on that uh, and they're taking their tact um, we're working on it, and, and it's something that we'll continue to work on, as we do with all of our uh, you know, legal obligations. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, do your research. Again, it goes back to being a business. Um, and if you run your business well, and you do what you need to do, then you'll be fine. If you're not running your business well, and you aren't aware, and you're not even bothered to look at what you need to do, then chances are you might not be fine. Um, so what I would say is it might, it's not necessarily just your affiliate sites that, that, that will be affected, but uh, other forms of marketing as well. Um, to conclude the presentation, really, um, and hopefully there's some things in there that you realize you're falling down on, is that you as an affiliate need to evolve what you're doing. You can't stay still, and if you, if you do, you will be going backwards in this industry. It's such a fast-paced, fast-moving environment that if you're not moving forward and evolving, then you're going backwards. Make sure you diversify. Diversify your 
offering, diversify your markets, even diversify your affiliate network. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying that. Um, and play by the rules. If you play by the rules, um, you'll be fine. And that is basically it in a nutshell. Uh, grow your business, treat your affiliate marketing as a business. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions. Okay, got time for two or three questions. Not just on what was covered there in terms of removing and managing risks in affiliate marketing, but also as the managing director of Morney. What an opportunity. <coughs> Who'd like to go first? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just what are more niche doing to ensure that all the merchants follow these rules as well? Uh, in terms of the merchants, um, we've invested quite a lot of time and effort in taking merchants through um, through the review process uh, that we put into place. As I mentioned, um, merchants now have a full list of claims uh, in which they can make uh, on, the, on our website, so every merchant has supplied what that is allowed to be said about their products and what isn't. Um, we will be more than likely taking a greater step moving forward to, to ensure that those are, are in force. Um, but we, our job as a network is to protect our affiliates and our merchants. Um, so one of the things we need to do is ensure that all the products that are in our network can legally be sold. Um, and we have quite a stringent process uh, which our merchants go through to ensure that every product in our network, as far as we're concerned, can legally be sold on the market in the capacity that it is being sold. Um, so to answer the question, what we're doing is making sure that the products are legally allowed to be sold um, and uh, ensuring that the claims that the merchant is happy for us to make are being transmitted to the affiliates. Andrew, you seem to uh, be your managing director, so you're looking at the business overall from a strategy point of view. You also seem to enjoy getting your hands dirty and getting involved in the day-to-day. -day. Do you have a home life? Uh, yeah, more so nowadays than before. Um, yeah, it's fair to say that when you first start any business, like you guys know, you know, you need to invest a lot of time and effort into that. Running a business is great. It's enjoyable. It has its risks. It has its ups and downs. Um, in terms of the question about getting involved day-to-day, -day, I love nothing more than talking to people about what it is I do. Um, I really enjoy talking to affiliates, merchants. I enjoy people ringing me up who have nothing to do with my business and asking me questions about what is affiliate marketing. Um, even if they're completely detached from the business, they're selling watches online or whatever it might be, I just I love affiliate marketing and I love talking to people about it. Um, so I, I, I would never want to be in a position where I couldn't do that. So yeah, that's why I enjoy these events because it, it's an opportunity. and, and one of the most lonely things, I think, about being an affiliate is that often you, you just sat in a room on your own behind your desk and there's no one to speak to. So events like this are great where you can actually talk to people that understand what it is you're doing. Um, and not many people even know about affiliate marketing. So, uh, yeah, talking to people about what it is we do um, and, and, and having that interest really is, is, is critical, I think, for anyone that's running this business. If you're not interested in what you're doing, then you might as well clear off um, because it's not going to work. Please give a round of applause to Andrew Slack.